it's a really cool territory. Also surrounded by private property, so you have to get permission to get into Hungry Gulch. And um, yeah, that's Hungry Gulch. So Three Oak Hills all basically look like that. They're just really awesome. So again, for reminder, this is where the Cerritos Hills are. They're just south of Santa Fe on the Turquoise Trail. And um, there's a state park there for reference. You can also, if you're gonna go to Cerritos Hills, I would recommend stopping into the mining museum that's there and just kind of taking around a look at the shop, talking to the shop owner, Mr. Brown, he's really cool. Um, it's just a cute little town, all buildings from like the 1800s. Um, so here we have a geologic map of the Cerritos Hills, and I'm going to refer back to, these are just little clips of the statewide geologic map that I kind of clipped out sections for you. Um, see, you can actually see the highways are red lines on there, so you can kind of see the highway where there's Albuquerque. I'm going to step away from the camera for a second. Just for reference for Cerritos Hills, this is Albuquerque down here, then we have the Sandia Crest, and Santa Fe is farther up to the north. Um, so what we're really looking at is Cerritos Hills, where they did the mining, is in those red dashes, the tertiary intrusive rocks. So I hope you don't mind, I am going to read for the geology slides because I want to make sure I get this right for you folks. Um, the Cerritos Hills are remnants of state volcanism that started about 34 million years ago and lasted about 5 million years. The volcanic material is called the Espinazo and is the extrusive equivalent of the stocks and lacoliths of the Ortiz Porphyry belt. The turquoise comes from later, a later super gene event associated with the oxidation of pyrite production of sulfuric acid and remobilization of phosphorus and copper. Turquoise in the Cerritos Hills probably formed no earlier than the late Pleistocene, about three or four million years ago. Um, so the Cerritos Hills are known for their turquoise, but they were also mined for silver and lead. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the silver and lead. Um, the silver ores formed in nearly vertical veins associated with tertiary volcanism as silver lead sulfide, commonly known as galena. Okay. Um, over millions of years, the descending surface water oxidized the sulfide ore above the water table, then the water liberated the silver ion and carried it down to the water table. So there's actually a zone of enrichment in the Cerritos Hills right above the water table at about 100 feet deep. And that's where most of the mining is. So when you walk through the Cerritos Hills, if you go out on the trails, you'll see a bunch of shafts dropped and there are drifts at about 110 feet down. So that's how they were mining the lead and the silver. Um, the Cerritos Hills has got a fascinating mining history. It is one of the first mining districts in the state of New Mexico. It's not just the first one I went to, but it is one of the first ones in the state. So the Pueblo were mining for turquoise starting around 780 and the turquoise from that mine has been found all the way down to Mexico on the Yucatan Peninsula. It was highly regarded as just beautiful stone, right? Um, then they were also mining at the Bathsheba mine for lead, and they found that the lead pottery that dates back to the prehistoric pueblos is all chemically related to the Bathsheba mine. So there was like some interpretive signs by the Bathsheba mine put up, I don't know, like before the last time I went there, and I read a little bit of the history that was on the interpretive sign, and what it was saying was that the Pueblos actually dug out the mine, mined for the lead, used it in their pottery, and then when the Spaniards came, they filled the mine back in. And the mine was filled in for a couple of hundred years. Then once they chased out the Spaniards with the Pueblo Revolt, they opened up the mine again and kept digging out the lead. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then this bottom mine that you see that has the chain link fence over it, that's actually a mesh. That mine is the Mina del Tiro, 
and that is the first known metal mine, the first recorded metal mine in North America. Um, so just some fun facts. I got to see some really cool old mines in the Rios Hills, and those are actually all on private property, so you can't get to them from the state park, but you can, you can know that they're there, and if you want, I can tell you how to get to them later. Um, but first I want to show you guys Mount Kalkawiti. So I told you that the Pueblos were mining there since 700 AD, and this is where they were mining. This is the pit that they mined at, and um, I found this quote when I was doing research, and I was actually struck. I felt the same way. When I read this quote, I was like, yes, that describes the feeling. You know, you come up down this trail and you see this massive hole and you, and you know it's like man, people were digging that hole thousands of years ago for this stone this stone so it it, it, has, it has a really cool feeling around that hole and one of the stories that i heard is that they would um they would build fires on the rock and then douse them with water and that's how they were breaking the rock open to make the pit there were some small adits and alcoves, but those have collapsed. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool spot. It's really secret. It's not super secret, but it's special. Um, and if you talk to the locals, you know some of the locals have access to it, so you could you could try to get in. Um, okay, so on to the mine closures. All the different types of mine closures. The picture on the bottom left that is inside Hungry Gulch, and there's not much of a closure there. That was actually a backfill. I don't really have pictures of backfills in my slideshow because they're really just backfills. It's just like you can, they were they were so good that a lot of the times I couldn't even find my closure. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> backfills. But um, okay, so we have the backfill in Hungry Gulch. Up on the top there is a grate closure and that was actually pretty steep I almost dropped my scale down that so um, it was it was pretty sketchy and then um, we have a mesh closure here in the middle and I'll get into the mesh closures they'll get their own slides so you can see all the different types of mesh that I that were up there but you can see that hole just goes down and then in the top right is a monument all the mine closures not all of them backfills won't have a monument but a lot of the mine closures will have a monument um, and that tells you that they are official. You'll see the EMNRD, and that's Energy, Minerals, Natural Resources Department. That's the New Mexico division that really runs the mine closures. Um, so yeah, there is one different type of closure that I don't have on this slide, and that's the Bat Cupola. And that's Bat Cupolas, these in Cerritos are really special. They made them pretty because of the state park, but um, Bat Cupolas are Neat, you know, so they're not going to completely close down all of the mine shafts because over the hundreds of years that they've been open, habits like wildlife has turned it into habitat. And so how do you keep bats in an area and keep the mine safe at the same time? So these bat cupolas are designed with the bats in mind. There's a metal grate around the bottom that you can see, and that's to keep small predatory animals from hanging out at the edge of the cupola. All of the openings in the cupola are designed with the local bat species in mind, and so those openings are big enough for the bats to get out, but not so big that predatory birds can get in. And then in the top, you'll see there's a grate, there's keys, so if you have that mine claim, you can actually get the key, you can open it, and you can go in, you can attach your harness to the top if that's your mine shaft. Um, you'll see the picture in the top right has two bat cupolas in it. Those two cupolas are actually connected via underground drift. So there's a tunnel connecting both of them underground. Um, so they do, they do keep wildlife in mind with these closures. Um, moving on from bat cupolas, we have mesh closures. So I found two, three, three different types of mesh closures. Um, one of them will look like just a regular chain link fence. That's just a single strand mesh. Um, and those are going to be the two bottom ones. And this one with the bridge, you can actually, that's in the Cerritos Hills, so you can walk over the bridge and look down the mine shaft. Um, it's cool. It's really cool. Um, and then, so there we have the single strand mesh, 
and the triple strand mesh. And the triple strand mesh is the one in the top left. The, the diamonds are larger, the wire is larger, and it has a higher tensile strength. Um, you can think of it as like the mesh that you'll see on the side of a road cut when there's an unstable rock face above a road cut. You see that triple strand mesh? That's basically the same mesh. And then I found this third type of mesh on one closure. That's the top center image right there. You'll see that there's a ladder going in and there's also an opening in the footing. So there is a grate in that with a lock. Um, I think I might have been on private property. Either that or like very close to BLM. Not exactly sure if it's a patent claim or just a claim. But I do know that in that area, there are some active claims in the area. So they just keep them closed. Um, especially there, that's where they do a lot of uh, the New Mexico film industry in the ranches just outside of the Torrios Hills. So those are the closures. And again, in the top right, Mina Del Tiro, I just can't use enough of those pictures. Um, I think it's cool. It's the oldest mine. <laughs> uh, moving on, fence closures. There's a lot of fencing in Dorios Hills. Sometimes they'll put a fence around a backfill. Sometimes they won't. Um, but there's different, there's different types. There's wrought iron, chain link, and then a small animal fence. And you'll usually see the small animal fencing if there's like a large trench or something where you can walk out the bottom, they'll fence the top edge just to make sure that you're not falling over the high wall. You can come in and out of the bottom. And it's, it's really all about safety. That's what we care about. The one type of fencing that you won't see on my slide is the barbed wire fence. And that's because all of the barbed wire fences were damaged in some way. And they were actually just put up as temporary kind of stopgap measures, and then they just never got back out to the territory. So. Moving on, we have puff closures. So puff closures, you'll see they all have this kind of central concrete <coughs> donut with a little grate over the top. Those are venting, and the venting goes down below the puff closure. So a puff closure is where they drop two chemicals down into the shaft on top of a platform. The chemicals mix, they have a reaction, they cause a foam expansion, and it closes the mine shaft. It's stable enough that once the, the, puff, the puff has kind of settled and calmed down, then they, um, they just toss a little bit of dirt on top of it. I don't know how much dirt, maybe a foot or two, and then um, that's it. So they don't have to backfill a 100-foot shaft. Um, a lot of these puff closures are high on the hillside, um, and if, you know, if you're out there mining, you're going to toss the dirt down slope, right? That's how you get rid of it. So it prevents them from having to carry all of that dirt back up the steep hillside, and they can still get a safe closure. Um, I think the puff closures are neat because they're just scattered everywhere. It's like the easiest closure, and um, they are in the hard to reach territory. So whoever carried that equipment out there to mix concrete, you know. Good for him. I had like two liters of water and I didn't want to climb up the rest of the hill. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, okay, and so these are the reason I'm out in the field. These are just a few few things that I found out in Cerrito Hills. I mentioned the culvert that had washed out. Um, a full-size body could easily get through that hole. Um, and then the, the barbed wire fencing was all cut, always cut, and you could see it tossed wrapped back around so they would only cut like one section of it they would leave the rest of it and then they would just pull it back around um, and it was just kind of tangled up on the side of the closure sometimes the barbed wire fencing and post was tossed into a bush next to it um, but these these closures um, were everything in Cerrito Hills if I tell you it's up on a hill one more time you'll probably shoot me but Seriously, they're far up there. Those hills are really steep. Um, so it was fun to find them. I mean, I actually felt like I was doing my job when I found something that wasn't safe. You know, I could mark it, put it in the book, and they can get out there and fix them now. Um, and pocket candy. Pocket candy is my fun little word. Um, it, it references all the little pebbles that find their ways into my pocket. Um, I did have permission 
from the local landowners to pick up pebbles that I found on their property. Um, so these were all with permission, um, but there's just some fun pieces of turquoise in Cerritos. Knowing that Cerritos is known for his turquoise, if I found a little pebble, I was, was definitely going to enjoy it. And there's also some azurite, so those, that black looking piece on the bottom, um, when I found it, it was just like glowing in the sun. And it was like, how could you not stop? I had stopped dead in my tracks. And then um, the picture on the left is a vein that I found. Um, that vein was gone a month later. So that was actually really sad. Um, but I did have the pleasure of finding it and seeing it and getting in there and just really appreciating it. And it's like, wow, that was cool. That was my introduction to abandoned mine lands. And uh, it's been a special treat this summer, that's for sure. So, uh, so moving on. We are now going to go to Luis Lopez, which is, well, let me show you the map. This is the hillside of Luis Lopez. Again, more hills. These are fun hills too. It's always fun for me. Um, Luis Lopez is just south of the Coro by about seven miles. It's, they are in the first set of hills west of the Rio Grande, and those hills are referred to as the Chupadera Mountain. Um, Heater notes for the geology because I want to make sure I get this right for you folks. But um, so we're going to go on to the geology slide so you have a little bit of reference while I'm talking. Uh, again, I put a box around the Chupadera Mountain and a little cutout over here on the side. So the core of the range is a massive rhyolite over a thousand feet thick, covering an area of approximately 10 square miles with different sequences to the north and south end. The north sequence is tough rhyolite and volcanic breccia with interlayered rhyolite and andesite flows. The south sequence is welded tough rhyolite and andesite. The northern and southern sequences are older than the massive rhyolite in the middle, which is intruded by plug and dikes of rhyolite in the north and lactite dikes in the south. Um, so that's the volcanic description of the area, but what they were actually mining in Luis Lopez is manganese. So the major manganese deposits occur in breccia zones or steeply dipping fault zones in the massive rhyolite. Manganese oxide minerals occur as banded petroidal vein fillings or as stock works of veinlets cementing breccia. And the ores are considered to be of hydrothermal origin. They're also considered to be some of the best examples of manganese in breccia zones in New Mexico. Hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> uh, okay, so just a few little nuggets of mining history in Luis Lopez. This information I have is for the Red Hill Mine and it came from a paper published in 1956. Luis Lopez was mined after 1956. That paper just had the better description. It's really hard to find information about these old mining districts. Um, so, so basically from 1944 to 1956, it was under production and it con production continued after 1956. In 1955, Luis Lopez was one of the top producing manganese mining districts in the country. In 1956, it was averaging about 2,000 tons of ore a day. Um, so all of these reference Red Hill, and I actually don't have any pictures of Red Hill for you, but that's just because the hill has been completely excavated. Like it's, it's almost not even there anymore. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you pictures from the Nancy mine because that's where the closures are. So mine closures, oh yeah, you've got to enjoy the view for a second, right? I mean, this is beautiful. If you look hard enough out in the horizon, you can see there's a funnel cloud out there. Um, and so it was in the spring, and the spring in New Mexico, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Uh, five minutes after I took this picture, a thunderstorm came over the top of me, and I was running into the truck watching lightning pass over the top of me. Um, really beautiful territory there. Okay, so the Nancy mine, we've got the head frame, and you can see that black arrow in the left-hand picture. That's actually pointing to the trench 
that all of these next few slides are going to be taken from inside of that trench. Um, and the head frame is kind of like at the end of the trench there. Okay, so here we have some, some different back closures, right? These are all back closures. They're just not the beautiful back cupolas that we saw in Cerritos Hills. Um, that, was, that was special because of the park, but these are just some of the different closures we have here in the Nancy Pit. I don't know how deep they go. Um, I do know that they were really hard to find. These were some of the closures that were done in the 90s. They were marked on paper, transferred to a GPS unit on a computer. You know, just, oh, I see it's here on the map. Let me put a dot here. And so a lot of the time we were digging through this trench just looking for anything close to where the dot was. Is it somewhere close? And at one point we found the monument put on the side wall of the trench. Um, I don't actually know where that closure was, but I found the monument and I documented it. Um, and then I believe that vent is a vent for a puff closure. So I think they were, that might have been one of the first puff closures. I'm not sure. And then it's just kind of like a view looking down the trench from the inside. Um, it was really otherworldly in there. The boulders were huge and they were all loose. It was all loose rubble. Um, very cool. There's lots of tumbleweed down there too. Lots of stuff. Okay, so moving on from the Nancy mine, this is Gloriana. Um, Gloriana is mentioned in the documentation, but um, in the GPS unit, it was marked as a remnant road. So uh, I came, I followed the remnant road all the way to the end, got to the end, turned right, and I saw this giant hole. Um, this is not a remnant road. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're counting the road that went into the hill. And um, so obviously the closure is there for a reason. You can see inside you have a collapsed structure going down. So um, so again, don't I don't enter any mines. I don't recommend anybody else does. These are all old, old structures. Um, but I did get a picture, kind of put my phone through the grate, took a picture that way. That's how I got that picture. Um, yeah, they were still pulling manganese out of Gloriana. So all of the mines in Luis Lopez were mining for manganese. Moving on to Oro Grande. Um, Oro Grande was a couple of different day trips. Mostly this is all gonna be from one day trip that we took as a group. We all drove down together. A bunch of interns were with me, maybe like one intern, Eric and Rob were with us. And so we drove to Oro Grande. We were camped at Luis Lopez. We drove to Oro Grande through a snowstorm, um, and you can see weather in the distance. At one point during the day, it was hailing and raining and windy on us, and um, so that was fun. It was fun seeing that on a good weather day. And as for really great picture, um, so Oro Grande is in the south. It's just south of White Sand Missile Range. Um, it's just one little chunk of hills in the middle of a basin. And here's the geologic map showing you that. It's just one chunk of hills <laughs> in the middle of a basin. Um, so the Oro Grande Mining District is located in the Haria Mountains. There are a small range of mountains in the Tularosa Basin of mostly upper Paleozoic limestone, sandstone, and shale intruded and domed by tertiary igneous intrusions. Ore deposits in Oro Grande, except for turquoise, occur as late stage veins and limestone replacement deposits and scars associated with the intrusion of the tertiary monzonite quartz monzonite stock complex. The turquoise formed during the supergene alteration of the monzonite stock. Um, so there is turquoise there. And I've got a, a big piece up here on the counter with turquoise on it. You'll see that, a picture of it in my pocket candy slab coming up. So that's the geologic history. We have the mining history. And the mining history that I found started in 1879 with the arrival of European prospectors. The area had been previously mined by locals for turquoise, um, but I couldn't find any information regarding their turquoise mines. The only reference I could find to it was that in the 1890, Amos Sinew, I don't know how to say his last name, 
he rediscovered the turquoise workings that were left there. Um, and so he mined those until 1898 when he was killed. Um, but so there was, so they weren't rediscovered, but there's no information about the previous turquoise workings. Um, in the 1890s, there was a branch line of the railroad put into Oro Grande, and that branch line was extended. So there is a railroad trestle that goes through Oro Grande Mining District. And you can see if you follow the trestle areas where the trestle, the path for the railroad was just cut straight out of the bedrock. I mean, they just, they were miners. They cut rock. So they made a hole for the railroad. It was it's really an interesting area. Um, they did build a pipeline in 1907. It actually started construction in 1904 and the pipeline was completed in 1907. After that, it really started to boom. They put um, a large smelter out there. 1904 is when they built, I think, when they started building the smelter. 1916, they extended the railroad. Um, the smelter changed hands a couple of different times. And then in 1918, they shut down the smelting operation completely, and mostly all of the large base metal mining in Oro Grande stopped. Um, that is to say that they mined out the district. There is no longer large stockpiles of base metals in Oro Grande. Um, everybody that's out there mining these days is mining for turquoise, right? They're all hobby miners. Yeah. It's, um can't think of the name of it. Garnet active in Oro Grande. I heard that was one of the biggies in the country. Garnet mines? Uh-huh. I don't... It is? Yeah, Eric. Eddie was leading us around quite a bit of uh, almadine exposures and uh, what yeah. was the green? Yeah, there's a piece of garnet up here from garnet, um, but I don't know like... So yeah, it is an active mine because it is one of, um, Eddie DeLuca is a miner in New Mexico that has claims in a few different mining districts. And he's the one that actually toured us around in Oro Grande and talked to us. And so he, I think he actually holds the claim on garnet mines. Um, I don't know how actively he's mining it, but I do have a piece of garnet there if you want to look at it, the massive garnet chunk. Um, I left the bigger piece at home, but yeah. Garnet is there and it is, Active, but I don't. It's not like a large producer. He's not pulling massive ore and processing anything out of it. I mean, I know he's active. It's it's actually a cool. I didn't get a picture of garnet mine in here, um, but one of them it's a closure. And because um, Eddie works a lot by himself out there, he had them instead of like they have these huge heavy grates. I'll show you some pictures in the closures. These heavy grates. And um, they made a special grate for, the, for that shaft, and it actually opens up vertically. It's on a hinge, so he can just hinge it open by himself. Um, um, speaking of heavy grates, two on the left-hand side um, are heavy grates. And actually, all of the closures I went to in Oro Grande were previously vandalized and welded shut. So a lot of these had bars that you could get a key. You have a key, the, the claim owner has a key, mostly Eddie DeLuca, and um, he can open the, the grates. He can unlock the bars and they swing out or he can lift them up and pull them out. Um, because of vandalism in the area and wanting to keep the mines closed for public safety, they just go out with a welder and weld them shut permanently. So you'll see a lot of weld marks on the sides of these, and that's because they had welders out there shutting the shutting the mine shafts completely or the, the attic. There's one grate I was there maybe 10, 15 years ago. It really had an emotional impact. It had a beautiful plaque on the grate that all the teenagers that died going in. So there, there are, unfortunately, a lot of stories in Oro Grande about teenagers, um, and not just teenagers, motocross folks, and that's what, there's a huge drive out there, right, the emotional impact of the tragedy, I mean, it's, it's real, so, uh, so that's what, they, they do actually do take these closures very seriously in Oro Grande, and the locals will just shut it down, if somebody tries to break in, they'll go out there and close them, um, this mesh netting, 
is all at one mine. It's called Lucky. And um, Eddie tells me that when he's out there, probably, I don't want to like kind of give a false number, but I, it sounds almost like once a month or every other month, he's out there closing this closure because people have are trying to get in and get stuff. And what they really don't know is that there's not much left in there. There's, I mean, there's tons of turquoise on the ground outside. You can just pick up turquoise if you want to. Um, but they're going in for the metal, and there's really not enough metal left to make it worth anything. But um, it's definitely very hazardous. And you'll see more pictures of Lucky coming up. Uh, the one in the middle was actually a high wall, and instead of putting a fence around the top of the high wall, they knocked down the top of the high wall and let the, the rubble kind of pile up at the bottom to make it more of a gentle slope so that you're not falling off a cliff now you're tumbling down a hill. So that was just a different type of closure that we found. Um, can't really vandalize that much unless you got a equipment, but they'll try it out there. There's actually a story, and I think I might have a picture of it. I might have taken the picture out, but um, Eddie had put a fence up around a high wall of one of the pits actually out at Garnet, and um, they cut the fence to get the backhoe room to back up because they were stealing dirt. They were just out there trying to get the dirt. Um, so, so there's all kinds of vandalism. It is south, but uh, lucky. There it is again. We just look at it for a second. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> it, it made me happy. This was one of the hardest mines to work at because of all of the turquoise on the ground. Like I said, it's just on the ground. That's a picture. I, I cropped my boot out. I used my boot as a scale for that, but. Um, cropped it to make it fit. And it, this is a huge stove. I mean, there's just tons of workings underneath this mesh. And the mesh is, it's really strong. I mean, Eddie was out there walking on it. You can, theoretically, you can drive a vehicle out on it. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah, lots of workings out there in Lucky. And then moving on to Nanny Baird. Um, this is where the weather started to set in. And I actually did go under under the alcove a little bit because I had to get in to the closure. The closures in Oro Grande are kind of tucked in to the attics a little bit. Um, and this one, you can see there's metal welding on the crossbars time and time again. And so somebody goes out with a welder, cuts the crossbar, and then the miners go back out with more metal and put another piece on top of it and weld it closed again. Um, that's kind of the story of Laura Bondi, really. Uh, but while we were looking for Nami Baird, I was walking around the hills and found these other closures. Um, these were all fine. We, they were not the purpose of going out there, but I just thought it was really cool and that I would show you some more pictures. Um, you can see how they're tucked inside. You know, and um, I think that's part of the era that the closures were done in Oro Grande. They were some of the first closures to be done because of the tragedies that happened up there. Um, and, and so these closures were just kind of like tucked in. Um, I didn't go past the threshold on these. The only one I went in past the threshold was when I had the, the hard hat on. Um, but they are cool. So this whole hillside is just like Swiss cheese, man. It's worse than Swiss cheese. There's almost nothing left of the hill. Once I started walking around and seeing all these openings, and hearing the stories about how long they had mined it and how heavily they had mined the area. To me, it's a wonder that the hill is still standing at all, right? I mean, it's, it is gutted. There is, there is nothing left in there. Um, but it's cool to look at. It's really neat. And pocket candy. These are some of my favorite slides. The turquoise. So that big piece on the left, I actually brought that piece to show you folks. Um, I had I told Eddie about my sister, she's in California, and so he put this big chunk in my hand as I was working and said, here, give that to your sister. Um, so I immediately took a picture and sent it to her and said, this is your gift from Eddie, you know? Um, and then in the middle are some processed pieces of turquoise that he handed us as a crew to just have as treats. And the one on this, this right side is something that I found when I was out there and I gave it to my neighbor, he carved fetishes, so he's from one of the Pueblos in New Mexico, and so if I find pieces that are good enough, I just toss them his way and see what comes of them. Um, so yeah, so that's Pocket Candy from Oro Grande. We're gonna move on to Jones Camp. Ooh, it's getting late. 
Okay, Jones Camp. There's not a lot of closures at Jones Camp. There's one shaft. It was backfilled. Just looked like dirt. Um, but it's still a really cool area, so I want to go over it a little bit, and I'll, I'll try not to spend too much time on Jones Camp. Um, Jones Camp is kind of right there. It's it's in the first hills east of the Rio Grande, um, and that's on the it's not the 60. I think it's like the 253 or something. The road that goes out to Carrizozo. Um, it's on an anticline. It's, it's on the north face of an anticline, and there's lenticular replacement. So let me, I want to get this right. You, uh, um, okay, so deposits occur as lenticular replacement of limestone adjacent to the west northwest striking montanite dike on the north face of the anticline. So all of the emplacements were, all the replacements, the magnetite and hematite were on the north face of the anticline. Um, and they were really just in like one small section. Don't have a lot of information for Jones Camp because it's just a very small district. It was mined for a short period of time. Um, but there are some huge excavations out there. So uh, yeah, so it was, it was mined for about 50 or 60 years. and. Um, this is actually a picture of the Jones Magnetite Mine. Um, again, it's just, just an excavation. There's not much you can do to close an excavation. Um, I did find Jones's camp. And it's kind of like right at the entrance to the Magnetite Mine. Um, I thought this was kind of fun. You know, you don't really get to see the camp very often. There's this old bed frame, green pods, metal pins. Um, and a shaft. There was one shaft out there um, that we found that's not closed. It's not on record. It's on record now. Um, you can see there's some barbed wire kind of tossed around. That was whoever was mining it must have pulled up a little bit. But um, this is definitely not a closure. And I would say if you find it, stay far away from from the shaft. I mean, it's, it's you know it's got the collar of local juniper. It, it hasn't been touched, you know, not for a long time. It was abandoned for a reason. Um, yeah. Jones Camp. Okay, so excavations. Uh, really cool. Big, just a big trench. That's what you get out there. Uh, a lot of them were just cut hillsides. This is all the same trench, just looking at it from different angles. Um, I found a bird's nest up on one of the side walls. That's kind of fun. Okay, we're getting on to Hardy's Pegmatite Mine now. Um, Hardy's Pegmatite Mine is in northern New Mexico, which is just south of Taos, and it's, it's actually part of the Pickering Mining District, but I separated it out because it is its own thing. It's owned by UNM, and you can go there. Um, before you go there, they ask that you get a copy of the waiver from UNM's website and you turn it in to the caretaker. I believe his name is Gilbert and he's in Dixon. Uh, please don't go to Hardy <coughs> without turning your waiver in for Gilbert and Dixon. But it is awesome. It's awesome. Um, so this is the view from up top. You're looking down onto a stove. So I'll have more pictures of the stove in a later slide, and you can see the fence on the top. That's actually um, a collapse. That fence is going around a collapsed structure. So I'll, I'll give you some, let's get into some pictures. First, I gotta tell you where it's at. There's the location of Harding Mine, and I have the geologic map. So I'm not gonna read you geology for Harding because they have papers and papers and papers on Harding. Um, it's really, awesome but I did want to put this extra side map in instead of a little bubble to just kind of give you a better diagram you can see towards the top you have a shift quartzite sequence and then on the bottom you have an amphibolite sequence and Hardy mind is kind of in the middle um, iceberg pit is there's um Icelandic spar like nice clear optical calcite in the iceberg pit that was a fun little treasure and I did find a barrel a little small piece of barrel 
in, um, in some of the country rock, and it was just up on the hillside walking from the iceberg pit into Harding Mine. Um, so some history about the Harding Mine. In 1918, Joseph Payer recognized the lipidolite as a source of lithium. The lithium from the lipidolite was used in ceramics for a while. Um, and then they stopped. They rediscovered Harding Mine again. I think it was actually Arthur Montgomery. I think he did his, his PhD on the Pickerys. That's where I got a lot of my information on the Pickerys was from Arthur Montgomery. Um, so the Harding Mine started mining the lipidolite, which was mostly like hand sorted and hand processed, trucked out over a road that they created to the mill, trucked out to, sorry, taken via railroad, and it was actually processed in West Virginia. It wasn't processed locally. Um, once 1929 came around, the lipidolite ore body was mostly mined out. The mine was abandoned. 1942, Arthur Montgomery picks it up and um, starts mining microlite by hand. Uh, microlite is a very, it was, it's a small, small version in it here. It's yellow. He said you could, you he had like a special way of figuring it out and so they would chisel the rock, the pegmatite body by hand and they would, because the microlite was too delicate for blasting. So if you blasted it, you would destroy the microlite. And um, so, so they hand sorted the ore for the microlite for quite a few years. Um, and then that ended in 1947. And then two years later, they started hand sorting the ore for barrel. And um, so that's why I mentioned that fountain one, because I just thought it was so cool to find them up there. Um, and so they actually um, mined for barrel, again, by hand sorting the ore. They were using chisels and hammers and like actually hand sorting the ore, taking it down to the mill, crushing it and, and taking it out. Um, so 1958 is when the barrel mining operation ended, and that's because Montgomery's partner, Griego, um, passed away, and so they, they stopped the mining operations. And then eventually, um, so the mine was given to UNM on a, a long-term lease. Um, UNM take, took over caretakership of the Harding mine, and it, they, they now own it, and it is still used for um, not just field trips, but it, you know anybody can go out there and see it. There's a little booklet that you get if you turn your paperwork into Gilbert. He'll give you some history on the mine. Um, so it's really a fascinating place. Um, fun fact: the barrel was hauled by a donkey that answered to the name Barrel. <laughs> My favorite fact about hurting mine. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is one of the closures. So this is underneath that stove. This is the main closure. And, um, and then there's just pictures of rocks because it's just a lipidolite. It's beautiful. I've, I've never seen such beautiful purple stone. Um, so some parting closures. Um, this is that upper closure, that stove. And we got pictures of it from different areas. There's me up on the top writing my notes. You know, I gotta take pictures from up close. So. I take the pictures, write the notes, everything is fine. It's a beautiful spot, it's really gorgeous. And then here's some pictures from the inside. Um, again, I didn't actually go inside. The camera was put in, not the body. And moving on from Harding, a bunch of different closures to all the different entrances. Um, all animal friendly closures. There is one story I was told about Harding Mine. I'm not exactly who told me this, or if they knew that it was exactly at Harding Mine, but there is something about how one of the closures was put up during the winter when there was a bear hibernating. <laughs> and so they built into the closure a pad where the bear could like step on it when it went up to the closure and it would open the closure from the inside. But once the bear got out, it couldn't get back in. was fun. It was a fun closure. And then here's a picture of that sinkhole up on the top. 
Um, so if you do go out there, just keep your eyes open. If you're walking around on the top, you know, just look for holes. Don't fall in one, please. <laughs> Um, they do have, they have people out there all the time. The caretaker does a really good job, so they are very on point with Hardy and mine. It is a safe, safer uh, mine to get into. And then we're going to move on to the Pickery, and Pickery is awesome. I mean, I could, I could, we talked for hours about Pickery. I, I was reading paper after paper when we were out in the field. Um, it's really great. So Pickery, again, in the same location as Harding, pretty much just across Highway 75, I think. Um, and it, it does encompass a large territory in the Pickery Mining District, but um, it's really a few points that I'll point out. Um, here's that geologic map. And what you don't see on the geologic map is all of the turns. There's a large overturned Syncline, and then there's also an anticline. Um, and then there's some M2 folding, some really cool stuff. I'm sorry if it grieves at the end. You guys are missing out. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to get some good theology in at the end. Um, so this is Goat Point. Um, this is a view looking down the Rio Grande from the top of Goat Point. And that's really like you drive up to Taos. Um, and you drive past the visitor center and the little village of Pilar. We're basically right on top of Pilar at this moment where I took that picture, just a little bit downriver of, um, of Pilar. Ghost Point, they were mining bismuth at Ghost Point. Um, that's one of those backfilled shafts I never found. I looked, I looked a lot. Um, I was on a mission to find that shaft and I could not find it. Um, but those backfills, once they're gone, 20, 30 years later, a good backfill, you just won't see it. You know, there's no way to put a monument on a backfill. So, good job, backfill people. Um, Copper Hill. Copper Hill is almost like its own little mining district inside the Pickery District, and it's at the top of the Copper Hill Anticline. But um, this is it. This is what you get when you go to Copper Hill. Just a bunch of green rock. Um, there are shafts all around the outside of this workings area where we were just kind of enjoying the rocks. Um, there are open shafts, so I would say just be careful if you're walking around on the trails up there, if you do get out there. Um, those shafts, I think, were just not found before because there were a lot of workings in the Copper Hill District that were, again, backfilled to flat ground. Nothing much. Nothing much to write home for. Um, Starlight is known to come from the Pickery Mountains. We went on a hunt for starlight. This is my my intern here on the side. This is one of them. He traversed a very steep canyon with me, and we pulled these rocks out. We were looking for starlight. Eventually, we did find them. Um, but I used this map on the left-hand side of the slide, so you can see the Copper Mountain Ridge. Um, KY is saying that there's kyanite in there. ST is starlight, SI is silmanite. And so the really cool thing about the Pickery Mountains, this is kind of it in a nutshell, is that you can find kyanite, starlight, and silmanite all together, kind of cohabitating in the same rock. It's, it's awesome. Um, there's also andalusite up there. I did not get a sample of andalusite, but I'll be back next year. Uh, that was a mission and pocket candy. Pocket candy and pickery became a little bit bigger than a regular pocket. We did carry out a couple of those slabs. Um, and then you can see some of these rocks on the table I actually brought over here on the side. And again, the views in northern New Mexico. I mean, all of New Mexico has epic views, but I, I just had to throw this slide in for one last, um, one last epic view. Thank you. Thanks for being so nice, you guys.